and welcome to the latest episode of the Online Warriors podcast, the final episode of March. March comes in, I think I say this every year. March is March the one that's in like, like a lion, out like a lamb. Out like a lamb. So uh, you should be feeling very lambish at this point. Uh, I'm Lily Woody Six. I'm joined by Tectic, who you already heard, and Nerd Bomber, who's lurking in the shadows. Lurking. Yeah, yeah just like that we are here today to talk to you about all things star wars marvel and one other thing those are the three topics today uh, we're going to be talking a couple of tv shows and a video game classic online warriors lineup just straight to the good stuff a couple of trailers and one just kind of a, a whispered rumors although i think it's not it's not a rumor it's confirmed the new office show is confirmed to happen it's just like what are the details and like i do think it's a good time to talk about that because it's been whispered for a while now and uh i have a lot of feelings about it but before we get into the topics you know how are you guys doing oh you know i can't complain good good yeah i i mean i I don't have anything specific i think usually i have like some poppy like oh what what, what website would you defend that was what we did last week but no i just i want to make sure everyone's i want to check in on people you know check in on your friends that's that's just a little we don't do tech tips anymore that's that's an illegal tip check in on your friends check in on everybody check in on your family just uh take a little time out of your day send a little texty text out if you need to and uh or or, or do a call if that's your thing Ooh, no it's, calls. yeah it's no it's calls. not my thing i call my mom shout out to my mom she's not listening i don't think she even well she knows i have a podcast i don't think she ever listens she's like i, I text everybody but my mom I, my mom i call my mom and sometimes i regret it I, sh- I can say that because i know she's not listening but sometimes she's like i'm going to talk to you about she's in this thing right now where she's watching a lot of food documentaries that's like the a like, phase. what about it though what about like, the food she was like it's mostly about like fast food and like well people who invented oh, how certain bad foods. it is well no i think it's more like she's i think she's watching them on the history channel people listeners might know what shows i'm talking about i don't know the titles of them but like for example last week she was like I watched an entire documentary like series about the history of the McNugget. That's like, that's like one example. Of, and I was like, yeah, I know it's bad for you. And she's like, well, it is, but there's a lot more to it than that. And I was like, I'm, I'm sure there is, but there's apparently a lot of food related television. You know how moms get into phases. I don't know if it's just my mom, but I feel like a lot of moms just have like little phases where they like watch a lot of food documentaries. I don't know. Yeah. Shout out to my mom. Let's talk about, talk about the office. Cause I, I already kind of, kind of teased that, but I, I want to just dive right into it. Now, The Office is an interesting show. I obviously, I obviously love The Office. I think, I think it's fair to say that most members of our generation, the cool, young, hip generation, we're not really that young anymore. We're like, we're you know, we're not, we're not like Gen Z. We're, we're I mean, there's discourse about if there's you're a lot on of like TikTok. There's a lot of discourse about how millennials are aging very gracefully. Oh, I've been. I, I feel like I'm aging great. I look good. But, but millennials, you know. I think I think because of when the office so the office of course aired on broadcast television and it, I think it was like 2005 to 2013 or something like that. You know, it, it it was appointment television. Like it was I don't know if about you guys but I I know that every Thursday night I would tune in and watch it and it was really great. But I think that when it hit Netflix, which would have been probably around that time 2013, maybe right after it ended, it just popped right onto Netflix. It was a it served as a comfort show for an entire generation is like kind of my that's that's what it was for me and most people that i know it was the same thing and i I would say that most people in our generation at least like it like it might not be their favorite show but like they're they're aware of it they know of all the references and they've 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 seen it you know at least once is that would you guys say that's fair first of all before we like get into the news here like i think that's the that's the characterization of the show yeah i would agree I also think an important characterization is its its specific humor is a product of its time. And I think yes. that needs to be said before we get into this. 100%. And, and you know, I, what we're hearing a lot about now, so obviously something like four years ago, I don't know exactly what time it was, but like it left Netflix because Peacock became a thing and they wanted to drop people to Peacock. So it, it went off Netflix. I will say I have not watched it since because i don't have peacock i've certainly seen snippets here and there i remember the show entirely but a lot of discourse now i think maybe not a lot but like something i've heard more and more in the past few years is that like people are kind of asking ahead and thinking ahead of you know thinking ahead to like how is this show going to age right because i think a lot of people look at michael scott and they're like oh he's he's a funny guy he's the source of he's the main source of comedy in that show 
and he means well is kind of like the, the broad characterization of his character but i think nowadays people are like looking more critically at him and how he's written and are like dude's actually kind of messed up and like if this happened to you in the workplace it would be messed up like i, I don't know if it's there's there's a cultural shift i think to maybe not thinking of it in a fully positive light anymore and basically starting to think about like okay are we gonna be able to watch this show in 10 years and like not you know kind of balk at it which i think is an interesting question i don't think that's going to happen i really just wanted to mention that because of what the the so i'm can i i'm gonna spoil it here it goes go, yeah go right in the news topic is they're looking at bringing the office back with a with the writers from Nathan for you. And I think that is an excellent choice because if they were to just remake the office as it stands with its current type of humor, I don't think that's what's funny right now, as far as like the newer generations, that's not necessarily their sense of humor. However, if you've watched Nathan for you, it's a lot more of this dry kind of uncomfortable humor, right? Which is exactly what the current sense of humor is. And so if they take exactly what's done in Nathan for you, and put it in the office format, new character, same universe, is what they're saying, I think that would do very well. And See, hear me out, though. I don't understand why they're making this an office show. I, I know that the IP is like gold, right? But make a new show then. There are other shows, I guess they're more in the vein of the office in terms of the comedy, but like American Auto, workplace comedy workaholics is in right. the office and so the one of the I, 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 I get, animal I control animal yeah control, animal control one. like yeah the, i mean the workplace not? comedy is just a genre it's it's not right like they don't why do we it. have to make this the office i guess like leave that alone i have never seen a tv show get remade successfully and i just worry about them ruining the ip because now a new generation of people are going to think of whatever this new iteration of the office is as the office it's what and the americans did to that british show right well, in the office we like, should talk just, about that be, be, just because, make it something new yeah see, so you know tactic you mentioned you know correctly that this is based on them getting nathan for you co-creator michael Komen, and it's got greg daniel's show running it who was the original showrunner for the the first american office if you've ever watched have you guys ever watched the british office at all have you ever tried it's did, very yeah. dry it's very dry it's it's a little bit like nathan for you and like i think i actually, I think if you watch the first season of the american office you see a lot of that british office you know uh, granted a little bit diluted but it's in there and then you know rightfully so the people who were writing the office and in charge of the office they they shifted away from that to what i would consider their own brand of comedy that is no longer that extremely dry thing that we first had so like to answer the question of why is it being called the office you know i think it's possible that greg daniels is thinking all right well we had an office that was really popular and successful but it wasn't the office that i wanted to make i wanted to make something that was more like the british office that was drier and now people are ready for that I, I'm, I'm serving as devil's advocate here i agree with you that i think it's kind of ridiculous to reboot the office uh, I, I think as a prince as a premise it doesn't really make much sense i think you should let that show be what it was and make something new but if greg daniels feels precious about the ip and wants to quote unquote do it right this may be the way he's going about doing that and i think it's i think again getting someone like michael Coleman and nathan for you that would be the way to do that i've haven't watched much nathan for you i did think it was really funny but it's, it's very good, yeah it's very dry and it's like it. uncomfortable it's uncomfortable to watch and that's like the point right so it is i think a worthwhile question tv shows these days pilots that are coming on i guess we should ask the question are we the target well, who's the target audience is it us or is it the younger generation because if it's the younger generation then they may be onto something here if it's us i don't know that i think we I think want the same thing the that the original office gave us but now i want what i want more is what you had even su suggested is that it's really just he had this vision of the show and now he's aligning the tools to just make his own art be what he wants it to be. And I, I kind of like that better. Who care? Whoever it's for, be damned. This is just, let's make art for the sake of making art. I kind of like that a lot better. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and I, I would like to think that he is. I think I, what I'm worried about, I guess, is that Greg Daniels was certainly important in the original office and its creation. But for me, Michael Schur was really the guy. He was one of the head writers on the show, I believe. And he later went on to do, some, do a little show called Parks and Rec. Wasn't He was also Dwight. He was Dwight's brother, right? Yes, he was Dwight's cousin, Mose. 
and he also went on to do the good place like not having him gives me a little bit of pause for sure but i think not having him is what makes it what what's going to make it feel different see okay True. but f- i get the dry skit humor which is targeted towards gen z but i feel like the reason why that works is because they're short skits i don't know if there's any skit that's over 10 minutes in nathan for you right right i think the reason why the american office was so much more successful in terms of longevity than the uk office was because it pivoted away from just very uncomfortable dry humor to making us care about the characters and i fully believe that the only way you can have a long-running tv series or even movie franchise is if you make people care about the characters i think in terms of the art form like that's what really draws a lot of people in they can either see themselves in the characters or they hate the characters or there's something about the characters that fuels them because you can have a really great plot but if you don't have compelling characters around that plot in any whether it's comedy drama what have you it's not going to work and so i just worry that this dry humor skit format is not going to translate well to a longer form series well yeah i don't what i will say is that like I again I could not get into the British office because the humor was like I, I literally think it's part of it is that I have anxiety like there's just big periods of like silence and like uncomfortable situations and like certainly the American office traffics in that but it does so in a, a very different way that I think is more accessible and, and doesn't make me squirm quite as much but I think even with that in mind like I think people still cared about the characters in the British office and the British office did have its own form of su- success so I don't know that those two things are mutually exclusive. I think you can still get people to care about characters in a dry setting, but I don't know, you know, I guess, you know, the, the original, the American office, it tried that dry humor and it pivoted away because it, I think they just saw correctly that like it wasn't playing. I wonder if it's, the, if the same thing's going to happen here, if they're going to go for this dryness and like, it's very specific. Nathan for you, I think was relatively popular, but it certainly was never as popular as the office. It was never remotely close to that. So if they want something big network like The Office was, I don't know if they can afford to be that that niche in their sense of humor. It needs to be more accessible. I, like it, The Office is... The, the American Office, I, I think it was better than a sitcom, but it was very sitcom adjacent, right? And the reason that sitcoms are kind of ever-present and ubiquitous is because they're accessible and everyone can, to some extent, laugh at them. It's, you know, this dry humor. Have you ever watched the clips of, like you can go on YouTube and watch like edited clips of friends where they take out the laugh tracks and it's just like mm-hmm. really uncomfortable. If they go in that direction, it's, Oh, they can't do weird. laugh tracks. No, they I'm not saying laugh. I, laugh tracks is so nineties and they're not going to do laugh tracks. I'm saying no, that but if like they the go with the direction, gaps of silence, right? Cause that's what it feels to me. They feel very similar and I don't think anyone wants that. I don't even think Gen Z wants it. Then again, maybe I don't really know what Gen Z wants. It'll be interesting to see what happens. This is, development stage hasn't even been greenlit yet so there's no like dates or anything but it it is like being actively discussed it's not going to surprise me at all if this winds up happening i'm not sure if i've mentioned on the show kind of before we move on from the office you know i mentioned parks and rec in passing i think to me parks and rec i I don't want to say the office hasn't aged badly that's not what i'm trying to say here but i do think that parks and rec has aged a little bit better i would agree for sure the the reason being i think i think parks and rec it's it's a little bit more outwardly wholesome. Wholesome is the right word for it. Yeah, I just think people, when people want to feel good, they're so much more likely to turn that on than The Office. It's, it's Again, that's what it seems like to me. Yeah, we'll see about this new Office uh, reboot. I don't even know if I want to call it a reboot, but The Office is kind of coming back. So let us know how you feel about that. We have a show Twitter, at Online Warriors 1. We also have individual Twitters, at OW Legal 86, at OW Tactic, and at OW Nerd Bomber. Hit us up there. For now, we're gonna we're gonna stick with TV. We're gonna move on to the Acolyte. Love the title of this. Let me start by saying that the Acolyte is an upcoming Star Wars television show on Disney Plus. I believe it's coming early June. I can track down that release date in a second. But this is a show starring Daphne Keene, Carrie Ann Moss, Manny Jacinto, and it is focused on the Old Republic and focused in particular on i guess i should say the the high republic so before episode one basically we got a trailer for this this week and it was promptly like downvoted to oblivion i guess is the term i would use i believe it currently has more dislikes than likes on youtube i i I can fact check that but the folks seem to hate it i watched the trailer and i definitely didn't hate it i don't know if i'm gonna watch it but like i don't know how you can hate anything based on a trailer 
I oh, honestly, you can hate things based on a trailer. I don't. I, don't, I understand that. I just don't know. That I, this didn't seem particularly hateable to me. Does it make me a bad Star Wars fan if I actually kind of thought it looked interesting? It, no. Again, it gave me the vibe that it might once again have kind of like what we thought the Mandalorian was going to be initially. Maybe not have anything to do necessarily with the Skywalkers. Like it might just be a side story. And that always excites me. I'm going to say something that might come off as incredibly ignorant. Were Go they ahead. unaware of what happens when someone coming from the dark side interacts with the crystals that it turns red? It seemed like this was their first introduction to the red sab- the red lightsaber. Is, am well, I wrong the, in saying this from a timeline standpoint? I, I, I certainly couldn't say. I don't think it's a dumb question. I, a lot of the discourse I'm seeing about it, I think a lot of what people are upset about is that in the first... In episode one of Star Wars, which, which incidentally is being re-released in theaters, I think next month, it's like a 20th anniversary thing. They specifically mentioned that like a Sith hasn't been seen for over a thousand years. The idea that, that upsets people is that what the heck, there's evil Jedi and this is not a thousand years before episode one happened. So what gives? You're breaking canon and then people get all upset. I think there's a couple important distinctions to be made. First of all, the word Sith is never used here. Like, I think people take Sith to mean Dark Jedi, and maybe that's 100% true. Maybe it's not. I, I think I think we're in a timeline I saw, here. I thought the Sith was like up. a specific race of people, almost. It's not a race no? of people. I, I, I mean, it's synonymous with Dark Jedi, but I don't. I think there can probably be other Dark Jedi that are not Sith Lords. That's like, I, I don't know. Someone chime off in the comments there on Twitter and, and correct me, but... I think that's what a lot of people had issue with. And I think that's just a really silly thing to take issue with. Like, I I think, first of all, you can give the story a chance to explain that because maybe it will. Maybe they're thinking ahead and and saying, okay, really eagle-eyed or eagle-eared viewers are going to catch on to that and be like, what gives? And we will tell them. I don't, like, I I agree with your characterization, Nerd Bomber, that like, this is, there's no Skywalkers and that's great. I still, I guess I just, Star Wars has done a really interesting thing where I would say probably 10 years ago, they had essentially a blank check. Like, I would trust anything that they do. Any any content they put out, I would be like, this is going to be good because it's Star Wars. They have, they have my fandom, like, unquestionably. Because of all the things they've done wrong recently, I think everyone is kind of looking at this with a much more critical eye. And, like, I think you could say pretty definitively that Andor is, like, one of the few things they've done right in the past three or four years if you if you are of the mind that the mandalorian went downhill which i think most people are you know with the tv shows especially they have to prove that they can do a tv show well like they're they're still being scrutinized for that and not without reason so you know but even watching the trailer with that mindset which i did like i again i don't know that i'm going to watch this but i didn't find it to be particularly disagreeable and it seems like a lot of people did i also think carrie and moss is a pretty good casting like, I think she looks very Jedi. I'm very on board with that. I don't know. Is it, are you guys going to watch this? I don't know if you guys... I don't know where you're at with the Star Wars shows. I don't know if you watched Ahsoka or any of those. Like, I'm off the train, basically, but I don't You've know if you guys are You've been off the train basically since the season of The Mandalorian where Luke Skywalker showed up. I believe we never hopped back on the train. I'm certain at some point we'll hop back on the train, even just because we'll run out of things to watch, and it'll be either star wars or marvel tv shows that we have to watch and i think i'm a little bit more marveled out than i am star wars out so we'll probably watch them eventually but we're we're not in the loop but this looked interesting and if i don't have to watch anything else to know what's going on in this high probability i'll watch it that is a good point and that's that has this has that going for it is that because of the timeline because it's before everything like i'm sure they're going to toss a varying number of easter eggs in there but it's not happening in the middle of something else so there's probably very little you need to show up with to to, to know what's going on i think that is really important do you think there's a potential that we'll see a gray jedi didn't we already see a gray jedi wasn't when? ray stevenson a great i think ray stevenson and again i haven't watched these shows in a long time but ray stevenson in ahsoka i think was supposed to be a gray jedi i agree that it's a great concept i don't know that we'll see it here this seems to be really concerned with the concept of good versus evil just straight up in the context of Jedi, which, you know, I, I like the idea of, like, you asked the question about the crystals before. Like, I would hope that's the sort of thing that they're they're dealing in here is, like, having characters confront those questions because we're seeing evil Jedi for the first time. Like, maybe that's what this is. I don't know. But I certainly think it could be good. You guys should watch Andor. 
the next show like if you like you said if you run out of shows and you're getting back to disney plus and or should probably be the first one you watch that was the best star wars show i've seen besides maybe season one of the mandalorian but yeah i i, I just i guess i think the hatred of this is a little bit unjustified it's a little but, overblown yeah people i mean I think- we live in a in a world right now where people love to hate on things without watching them or playing them or reading them or listening to them. And that's just the world that we live in. Well, and again, people with, with both Star Wars and Marvel, I think this is true. This is true. But with Star Wars, especially like people are precious about the IP and they want to see it handled right. And that just intensifies when you spend a few years just handling it wrong and doing it wrong and not doing it justice. So like, I think everyone is kind of, you know, they have their finger on the trigger now of like yeah, hypersensitive if, is the word. Yeah. If this doesn't, if this doesn't look perfect, then I'm going to point out everything that's wrong with it. And then the internet is a bandwagon. So everyone starts piling onto it. And now you have something like this where it just has a, a billion dislikes. I don't know that that's justified, but it is, you know, you kind of made your bed and you have to lay in it. Disney plus, like you, you have to, you care about these things or people will turn on you in a sense it's a cautionary tale but like one of these days one of these shows is going to come along people are going to say it looks bad and then it'll turn around and actually be good so they have to climb out of the hole in that way i don't, I don't know that this is going to be it but we will know pretty soon because this is coming out june 4th 2024 with its first two episodes and then there are six more being released weekly it's you know if we're not watching anything else i might try it but i think it's probably i think it's pretty unlikely I am going to go see Phantom Menace in theaters, so I'm definitely going to just go see it again because that, that movie is amazing. It holds up. Are you going to see The Acolyte? Carrie Ann Moss might drive me to it as well. Yeah, again, I think she's a she's a great casting. Uh, Daphne Keene, I'm not sure if I mentioned her. She's also in this. She's the little girl from Logan, if, if you remember that movie. So yeah, this is uh, June 4th, 2024. Are you going to see it? Let us know on Twitter. We mentioned the handles earlier in the episode. Are you upset about it like a lot of people seem to be? Or are you kind of like us where you're like, hey, it seems fine. You, y'all need to take a chill pill. We'll think about that while we're on our break. We're going to take a break now before we come back to talk about Marvel 1943 Rise of Hydra. But before we take our break and before we talk about that, I would be remiss if I did not shout out our fantastic Patreon producer, Mr. Stephen Keller. Stephen's been supporting us on the show for quite a while now. He was on the show recently. He got a guest spot as a result of his Patreon producership uh, on the show. He gets this weekly shout out. He gets the occasional guest spot. He gets input into the weekly game segment. And of course, he gets access to the monthly secret segment and the vlog. He receives all of these things as a result of his night level subscribership on our Patreon. There's also a squire level, which gets you access to the monthly secret segment and vlog and a page level, which gets you access to the monthly secret segment. We did our secret segment this month about March Madness, but we, we put a little twist on it. So you might want to check that out over at Patreon. It's patreon.com slash online warriors podcast. Go over there, get the details, say hi to us, say hi to Steven. Consider giving back to the show that you're hopefully enjoying. Thanks again to Steven. We'll take a short break now and come back to talk about Marvel 1943. With what feels like a never-ending stream of news and information surrounding us every day, how do we ever actually get something useful out of it all? Well, that's what the Assorted Goods Podcast is all about. It's a more casual perspective on what's going on in the world, where each episode your host Dan, myself, a regular guy turned curious mind, dives into a topic from the news, history, or whatever's on my mind that week. Then we slow it all down and dig a little deeper passing along all the things that I learned from me to you. Subscribe to Assorted Goods wherever you listen to your podcasts and join me on my journey to learn a little more. And, you know, not be too serious about it. I'll see you there. All right, welcome back. Marvel 1943 Rise of Hydro. We got a trailer for this last week. We had heard about this. I don't know if it was at an E3 or a previous uh, Gamescom or something. We had gotten a brief little like, this is happening. It might have been a video, but it didn't show any gameplay or any character models or anything like that. It basically just said, hey, this is a game that is being developed. Skydance New Media is putting this game together. It's based on a 2010 comic book, and it's set in occupied Paris during World War II. We saw a trailer featuring Captain America and Azuri, the king of Wakanda in 1943, who presently operates as the Black Panther. Yeah, this looked really good. I, I I think that 
I'm still going to struggle a little bit. Recall that when the Avengers came out, and that game, I think, wound up not doing very well, it was too soon on the heels of the actual Avengers. So we were all inclined, or at least I was inclined, to basically look at Captain America and be like, that's not Chris Evans. I didn't feel that as strongly with this one. I think there's certainly a respectable different, respectable distance between this character model and Chris Evans, but I think it felt a lot more right to me. I think it helps in that, A, it's a very different setting. Like, they're not trying to play it off as modern day Avengers. Like, it's back in the yes. past. You also have very a true. different Black Panther, and none of the characters are really calling back to the movies except for Steve Rogers. So it's a lot easier to like suspend. I don't want to say disbelief because that's not the right word, but like kind of suspend the Chris Evans of it all when it's a completely different setting, a completely different storyline and a different set of characters. I would also say it helps that I guess I don't remember the Avengers sizzle reels that well, but like this graphically looks pretty incredible. Graphic. Yeah. The triangles guys. There's a lot of triangles here. Uh, You know, obviously in a trailer like this, this was a story trailer. We're not seeing gameplay. This was all cinematics, but I mean, geez, if the gameplay is half as good as what we saw here, it's going to be very, very impressive. Yeah, they're using Unreal Engine 5 on this one. And, like, they, they, they did a bit of a deep dive on, like, the way they're la- layering the effects and they can adjust, like, snowfall and if you're the lighting on smoke. And, and it looks absolutely phenomenal. 10 out of 10 on graphic. I'm very, very interested. You know, I, I think the trailer laid out pretty effectively you know you're going to be playing as both of these guys and potentially the other two characters that were shown i think it's more than that so the other thing too that's worth mentioning is so there was the trailer and then there was again also they did kind of an interview with the with some of the creators and they had said you're going to be playing with a number of different heroes and i don't think it's going to be what just what we saw in the trailer i think it's it's going to be probably the four but also a surprise super soldier so in the in the trailer he had said yeah there's three there there's three super right. soldiers running around and in the conversation it makes you think that it's a female super soldier based on what you're hearing on the on the on the dialect but there's also kind of a weird skip in the trailer so it it's almost like they're trying to keep it secret and so if you think about what super soldiers were around there was Wolverine, which I don't think it's going to be at all because there's a separate Wolverine game and it, you don't want that to kind of that competing IP. It'll well, just make they're it different messy studios and, too. I don't think they would play in that space. Right. It'll it, And it'll make it messy from that side. It'll also, it'll take away from potentially the Captain America kind of side of things. So who is the third super soldier? Was that- Peggy Carter, was she... Did nope, she turn into that's a super? What if. That's what if. That's a Marvel. Where is if. Winter Soldier at this time? So Winter Soldier is a possibility, but he's not under the control of the U.S. Yeah, wasn't he like part of Hydra? Well, maybe he's yeah. the rise of Hydra, and 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 he wasn't even he wasn't even really part of Hydra. Like he was more of like a shadow op. But maybe that's the thing. Like maybe, and I, I know they kind of referred to it like there is a woman's voice, whatever. But maybe it's to kind of throw you off the scent. Maybe that, like, maybe he'll be there. Well, Red Skull would if they're going to talk about Hydra, Red Skull would be the obvious choice for who the third super soldier is. But I think I think it's someone on on your team, and so the choice to me that makes a lot of sense is Isaiah Bradley. Right, he is he is the the first. He's kind of the the prototype super soldier because they were doing messed up stuff and experimenting on troops before getting it right to to go on Captain America as we know him today. And that's like a dark storyline. It's really like fucked up from a human rights standpoint. And I think it would really give this game some gravitas if they went into that. Featured a little bit. uh, Isaiah Bradley is in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, the show. And like to go now back and when he's young and in his prime, I think that that would hit hard. I think that would do really well. Yeah, I, I... I do think it's interesting, and yeah, we shouldn't gloss over the fact that they they did kind of tease that there's a third super soldier, and they didn't. They you're you're right. They very purposefully did not show us who that was, so they're kind of waiting to drop that on us. Maybe in the next trailer, maybe not until the game comes out. I have no idea. But you know, it was it was kind of clear, or at least to me, it was clear watching it that like as Black Panther, your focus from a gameplay perspective is probably going to be on stealth and. As Captain America, your focus is going to be more on just punching folks. 
Like, is that was that the read you guys got from it? Because like, I think they're I think both characters are capable of both things. But what the trailer showed us seemed a lot more focused on like Black Panthers running on rooftops and like doing dishonored stuff. And Captain America is like on an on fire truck that he probably lit on fire by punching it a lot. I'll be very interested to see how they divide up the missions and the different play styles and the characters that you control at various times. Like Amy Hennig is at the helm. You know, she was I think Uncharted Two. She was the the game I believe that's runner, correct. whatever yeah. her title was. So we know she likes very cinematic, linear storytelling, at least just from the history of the games that she's worked on. And so is this going to be a linear story where you're just kind of like flip flopping between the characters? Are there going to be missions where you can choose which character you want to, you know, approach the mission with? I'm very interested to see how they're going to balance that because, you know, if, if you end up really hating the way that Captain America plays, but you love Black Panther, like as I'm getting older, and Tecta can attest to this. I used to be the type of person, like, we'd play Borderlands and I would be the tank because I would just run in and I'd start shooting. And I would put myself in harm's way and I would need a lot of, you know, health to get anything done because I was just, you know, right in the thick of things. Now that I'm getting older, I like to kind of be a little bit more stealthy. I like to, you know, if I have the option to, like, kind of be invisible or in the shadows, I like to go up behind people and take them out silently. And so... If you co-ops know. got more difficult, now it's a lot of no, you go in, no, no, you go <laughs> it's in. True, but like if I end up liking Black Panther's play style a little bit more, will I get frustrated when I'm forced to be Captain America? Will I have a choice? Will it not matter because they're going to do it so seamlessly? Where like you like both play styles? I'm just very interested to see how they're going to balance it. I think it's going it. to be concurrent storylines where you're switching between them as you progress. So you're going to have to play as both because you can't really flesh out the full story without it. But I think that's kind of neat that you're kind of getting exposed to two play styles. I mean, you're a big proponent of changing the game difficulty if you don't like it. This is true. I am not afraid to go on I'm, easy mode. Yeah, so I, I think I agree with Tactic. I think it's going to be back and forth. I do think they will give you choices at times to, as to, like, they're going to be working together at certain points. Which character do you want to be in that scenario? I think they'll give you the choice on, on occasion. I also, you know, the other two characters that are shown, Howling Commandos member Gabriel Jones and Anali, the leader of the Wakandan Spy Network, like, that's two more play styles. In particular with the Howling, Howling Commandos guy, like, is that is it going to turn into a shooter when you are playing as the Howling Commandos guy? Like, I, 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 that's a question that we simply do not know the answer to yet, but I'm interested in it. So I think this game, I think this, this trailer and this game is doing a lot of things right right now in the sense that I, I want to know more. What they showed looked fantastic, and it planted all these seeds that allow us to, you know, talk about it on a podcast. But I would hope the next trailer will show some gameplay and give us a little stronger of a sense as to what what we'll actually be able to do in this game. This game is not coming out until 2025, so I imagine between now and then, depending on when 2025 it is, we're going to be getting a bunch of extended plays. We're going to be getting a bunch more trailers. There's a lot more to see. Yeah, excited for this. Also love the idea of Occupied Paris being the setting. I just think that putting superheroes in that setting like like you said before nerd bomber i think it affords you a lot more opportunity to, to move away from the characters as moviegoers know them um just simply because they're in a different setting like that so yeah 2025 this will be coming out and uh i think it's fair to say we're all excited but there's more to come that brings us to what are you up to wednesday this is the part of the show where we talk about what we've been up to and this week i'm gonna go first because mine's really boring i you know i've I'm still watching The Sopranos. I'm still reading Dark Matter. Both of those things are going great, but I just don't have a lot of updates because I haven't finished either one yet, and I probably won't finish The Sopranos for a long time. This week, I was doing stuff to my house, which you have to do sometimes when you have a house, and it's it's unfortunate. As a tip to all the homeowners or potential homeowners out there, it's not really so much a tip as it is a warning. Tearing up linoleum is really hard and really annoying, and uh, I'm feeling my age right now. I'm like, my back hurts and my hammies are blasted and it's like kind of a good feeling because i accomplished something but it's also kind of a bad feeling because it hurts so that's what's kind of going on in my life right now which i said is not very interesting so i'm just going to kick it over to nerd bomber to keep us going here all right so we've been on a real big movie kick lately and now we're moving into just you know whatever we can find we're coming off the high of the entire hunger games franchise and just looking for lighthearted fun stuff and one of the ones that we chose, we talked about The Office earlier. This had Ellie Kemper, Happiness for Beginners. This is a Netflix yeah, original. I saw this movie. Kind of a rom-com. It's yeah, a rom-com. it was very, yeah, yeah, it's a rom-com. 
she, Ellie Kemper is the main character. She's going through a divorce, so she decides to throw herself into, I couldn't tell the time span of this trip, but weeks or maybe a month long hiking trip that through was a week. the mountains. It was a week. Was it a week? There's no way that was months. It was probably it was a, week. a week. I didn't say months. I said, like, whatever. Hiking trip for adults. And her brother's best friend ends up also on the same hiking trip. They kind of give it away in the trailer. I guess if you don't want the ending, close your ears for like the next 30 seconds. They obviously get together by the end of the movie. But it was just like a feel good, you know, you can do it. Ellie Kemper's character learns that she can kind of, you know, be her own person, start having a better outlook on life, just change her mentality, et cetera, et cetera. And for what it was, I mean, there's not a lot of rom-coms these days. I feel like there's a lot of like, let's be real, the Lindsay Lohan one with the Irish wish or whatever. That's eh, not exactly what I'm looking for. So this fit the bill for a good rom-com and I enjoyed it. I think because I watched this movie i think it was last year sometime i'm almost positive i brought it up on the show i may have been hard on it i i if i didn't say this i wanted to say it felt like it was written by a middle schooler for certain scenes it was fun it was fun i think that's just kind of ellie kemper's humor though a it was bit. like if even if you go back and you watch the unbreakable kimmy schmidt a lot of it feels like an innocent middle schooler wrote a lot of the comedy and to be honest that's okay with me like, if I'm watching something with Ellie Kemper at the helm, I know what I'm It was like. a very, very surface level romantic comedy, and I think that's fine. I, I, like, for, for what it was, for the 90 minutes of runtime, I, I thought it was entertaining, which is all, that, all it really needs to be, right? And I did enjoy, I think, the bit characters on the side. Like, the main romance felt whatever. Like, you knew right from the get-go that they were going to get together if you watch the trailer. But I found the side characters and their weird one-offs or quirks to be the highlight i think of the movie and tactic i don't know if you agree but like the weird the, guy, the guy, ukulele guy girl who the guy, guy who ended awesome. up you know yeah like they're just they're all good and there was the douchey guy yeah there's like there's a good yep. cast of characters i concur that's my input cool and tactic do you want to talk about the the other movie that we watched this week i do we watched totally killer which is kind of like a horror comedy i guess you'd call it it's a story about this girl, her mother, when she was a child, there was a, a sweet 16 murderer, killed killed some of her friends, and then that murderer came back later on, and so now the daughter wants to go back in time to try to, like, stop the killer and save the day. And it's like, it's a, it's a fun horror time travel -y movie, and I, and I, and I have to add the time tra travel -y part because, like, you're never going to get it right, but you're going to have a good time. And I think the 80s setting was as big of a character as, you know, the actual characters in the movie. The fact that there were so many jokes hinging on, you know, just how wild the 80s are. If you really look back on it compared to like what people could get away with today. Oh, yeah. Like the, the, the comment was made of like, quote, wow, airports got to be wild. <laughs> <laughs> because like you could just walk into a school and no one would question you they'd just be like yeah go whatever yeah airports like if you watch old like sitcoms where characters go to airports you're like oh they're actually like going to the airport like they're like in there even though they're not flying they're like taking someone to the airport and they're just like walking all the way to the gate and you're like wow that's oh yeah rom-coms don't used work to anymore you can't run to the gate and say stop i love you well no you gotta buy a ticket now yeah and go through security and also i mean there's i just watched that one movie that takes place like entirely in airports and it's it was a romantic comedy so you could still do it you just have to be more creative but yeah that is that is kind of sad uh, to think about i guess do you know you guys said you guys are on a movie like, kick do you guys know yes, what movies yeah. you should watch next no this, this is a this is a mini update that i remembered while you were you guys were talking about movies uh we just finished the those apes movies the planet of the apes like remake movies we watched the third one so now there's a i don't there's a fourth one coming out i think later this year take my nerd card i don't know if i care you okay i didn't care about them when I, they came out so i went into the my my wife heard about them on another podcast and was like we should watch these apes movies and i was in i was initially very skeptical or even derisive of the idea of like those are stupid it was basically my my presumption they will surprise you that's i like i i think that they're super super well done and they're very earnest in the messages that they're they, they're movies that have themes which like to some extent every sci-fi movie needs to have one but like i think they they're surprisingly well executed 
And if you look on like Rotten Tomatoes too, they're all like really super well reviewed. And I think there's, I think there's reason for that. I think one of them also won an Oscar for like the visual effects. You could do worse, I guess. If you're like as on a movie kick, as you said, you were, it's an, it's a nice trilogy to go through. Um, they're just, they're just fun, you know, but that's just a, that's just a suggestion. You could just keep watching romantic comedies and other stuff that that's equally satisfying. I'm sure. I'm not gonna, I need something like the Hunger Games. This is like the Hunger but- Games. That uh, that's is like it it's kind of what made me think of it is like it's a it's a it's a vaguely sci-fi trilogy. It it's to give you some perspective. It's it's how Planet of the Apes like it's like the prequel to it basically or the prequels. It's like how did that happen? Because do you know the gist of Planet of the Apes like the original? Well, they're apes who became advanced and have a society, and then we fight with them. Something like so, that. So, so this is kind of a spoiler for the movie that came out in like 1968 or whenever it was. Basically, the plot of Planet of the Apes is these scientists are on a spaceship and they like they are on some interstellar mission or something, and they go off course and they crash land on this planet, and they find that the planet has a bunch of advanced apes who like they they are apes, they're monkeys, but they can all talk and like they have they're like scientists and they like have a society basically. And you're like, wow. And they, and they like they managed to like enslave these humans basically and hold them captive. And you're like, wow, this is crazy. And then at the end of that movie, you find out that they actually time traveled in, when they were in space and the planet they're on is Earth. So these new movies, these three new Planet of the Apes movies are basically how did that happen? So like how did Earth become overrun by apes and how did humans become extinctified? And... Can I watch these movies for free? Do I have to pay for them? The first one might be free. The second and third one definitely are not. So you're right. That's an important distinction that I probably should have led with. If they ever become free, I guess we can go with that. The first one might be free. And if the first one's free, you should watch it. I think the first one is free. I think it's on HBO. The second and third, I'm pretty sure are not free. And I guess at that point, you can make the decision about whether you like them enough to watch them. But they're just, they're good sci-fi movies. That was, that, that was, that was my finding. Their visual effects are incredible. Andy Serkis is amazing. It's you could do a lot worse. I guess that was my point. Yeah, everyone everyone should go check out those apes movies. Are we at are we going to Quiz Town? Who's the Quiz Town conductor? We are today? going to Quiz Town. It is me. For I was the Netherland winner last week. Oh, that's right. That thing that I had no idea what it was. Well, you're five and three, so congratulations, your top dog. Tactic four and three. I am four and four in last place with a respectable five hundred record. And uh Steven, Owen won. He rejected his charity win. I'll never let him live it down. So I will be facing Tectic for second place ness. And actually if Tectic wins, he'll be tied for first place. So we stakes as always are high. Nerd Bomber, the floor is yours. And the stakes are also high in this year's March Madness tournament. See what I did there? Yeah. Great transition. It's the big dance. It's not a little dance. It is the big dance. It's the big dance. And so this week's trivia is all about March Madness, historical trivia, stats, etc., etc. As per usual, Price is Right style, all numerical answers. Whoever gets closest to the answer without going over will get the point. And I go first, right? That's correct. Yes. Sorry, my brain farted there. But yes, you do go first. And you each have one lifeline. You can either plus one or use the number one. And we will get into the first question. We'll start it off with women's basketball because you know what? They don't get enough love. How many women's basketball teams have finished a season, including tournament play, undefeated? In what? T- like in all time? Yes. Nine. That's a strong guess. I was going to guess seven, but I'm not because of strategy now. I'm going to basically cut the answer in half and I'm going to say four. No matter what you did illegal, it wouldn't have mattered. He hit this one right on the head. Nine teams have finished their season, including the March Madness that's tournament. That's like to start. Undefeated. That's crap. That's crap. All right, fine. Fine. Now, moving into men's basketball, Stephen, our valiant Patreon producer, is a big fan of Gonzaga. How many straight March Madness appearances have the Gonzaga men's team made? It's a lot. You're you're not up first. How, how, what's a Gonzaga? It's a team. It's the school. It's a school. I don't actually know where it is. It's a lot. I had a number that came to mind immediately. It might be too high, but I'm going to give Gonzaga a lot of credit because Steven likes them. I'm going to say 34. What was the question? How many straight years have they made the March Madness tournament? 35. Did you just plus one him? I did. I did. All right. Well, you both busted. Fudge. I got gotcha. you. In the March Madness tournament, 25 years running. Okay. So we were like, so. we were pretty close. 
I just, I figure they're an institution. You always hear about them at March Madness. Uh, I, I think it's a good outcome for me. Technically, it's just plus one. That's, that's, a, that's a W. All right, moving forward. Austin Carr holds the single game points record for the men's tournament. He set this record in 1970 when he played for Notre Dame. How many points did he score in that game? 43 points. 44 points. What a good use of the plus one this time. 61 points he scored in a single game. So Illegal gets that one, and it's a tied trivia game. <laughs> Hype. All right, so a perfect NCAA bracket is next to impossible to guess. The closest anyone has ever gotten in the last decade occurred in 2019 when an Ohio man picked the first how many games correctly in his bracket? 68. 68. Are there that many games? What? Yeah. I, it, this doesn't make sense. I, I believe the original... For the first round, I think it's... Well, I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to help you. I'm pretty sure it's possible. <laughs> go, Just go ahead and guess. I'm going to say it was like 12 games. All right. Tectic gets this one. He guessed the first 49 games correctly. So Illegal was closer, but Tectic, by virtue of the bust rule, got this point. Yeah. I mean, I think there's the first... There's 64 teams to start. So you know there's going to be at least 64 games. No, that's not good math. There's 32 games initially. And then... Well, yeah, whatever. I lo- I lost. Uh, that that question but i had i had an idea all right so it's two to one and if you get this right illegal i already have a tiebreaker in place so look at me planning oh i'll get it right i'll get it right what was the largest margin of victory ever in a men's march madness championship game 62 points that feels way too high 15 all right so illegal does get this one unlv beat duke 103 to 73 with a 30 point margin. Now, the bonus here and the tiebreaker, which you will text me, right? Is what year did this occur? Can you say the teams again? Are you allowed to do that? UNLV beat Duke. I don't know why I thought that was going to help. I don't me. know how that helps you, yeah. but. All right, you have my answer. All right. So, illegal guess 1984, tactic guess 2004. And the big winner, somebody give me a drum roll. Let's go. 1990. So Illegal gets this one and he takes the March Madness (sighs) trivia home. You know what? I don't follow March Madness, let alone March as a whole. That was madness. I moved to five and four, Tectic to four and four. So therefore, I leapfrog Tectic and I move into second place. I will be hosting next week's game. Which presumably will be about April Madness to figure out what that is. But uh, we have a whole week to do so. So that should be good. As it stands, March Madness is currently ongoing. I don't actually even know how long it goes for, but probably for another week or so. Maybe next week we'll know who won March Madness. Won't that be exciting? In the meantime, we thank you all for listening and for joining us here at the Online Warriors Podcast. Head over to Apple Podcasts. Leave us a review if you're so inclined, if you like the show or if you didn't like the show. Hit us up on Patreon, patreon.com slash online warriors podcast. And also hit us up on Twitter, handles mentioned previously in the episode. Have a great week. Hey, if you liked March Madness, our Patreon March special episode is all about Mark Madness, so you don't want to miss it. Who's the best Mark? You'll have to go over to uh, Patreon to find out, because we definitively determined who the best Mark is. Based on a number of factors, we had scientists, we had a whole thing. Excel spreadsheets, the whole whole deal. Uh, So go check that out, and uh, stay safe, have a great week. Stay safe and keep on podcasting.